Coming up on The Rock Newman Show, the partial shutdown of the federal government has sparked political and economic discourse affecting the lives of millions of Americans, including more than 800,000 federal employees. I'll explore and measure the impact of the shutdown to the Howard University community with our special guest, Dr. Wayne A.I. Frederick, president of the Howard University, as well as discuss other important issues facing the capstone. That's coming up next on The Rock Newman Show. Welcome to The Rock Newman Show from the campus of historic Howard University right here in the nation's capital. I'm Rock Newman and it is my desire to inspire you with personal stories of extraordinary achievement. This evening as the nation continues to deal with the effects of the partial shutdown within various aspects of the U.S. government, including the direct impact to over 800,000 federal employees and contractors, We'll take a look at what that means to the Howard University community. Joining me for an important conversation on its impact on Howard University, students, staff, and faculty, as well as Howard University Hospital, is Dr. Wayne A.I. Frederick, president of the Howard University. As a medical doctor and three-time Howard University graduate, Dr. Frederick is the 17th president in a distinguished line of scholars and educational administrators here at this historic university. As university president, Dr. Frederick strives to promote innovative ideas designed to support the success of the student body. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining Thanks me. Thanks for morning. having me. All right. My pleasure. Hey, um, man, there's so much to get into and so little time. But I want to start, I just saw some fake uh, social media posts uh, over the weekend. <clears throat> Uh, I saw uh, that you were running, I think, in Orlando. Uh, it was a 5K? Yep, that's a correct. A 5K run, raising awareness and money for sickle cell. That's correct. That's so, correct. It, you know, you've been on the show before. We've talked about that you, uh, you're, you, you have sickle cell. That's correct. And okay. tell us about the run. What was that? How did yeah. that come about? Well, I, I do have sickle cell. I was born with it. Both of my parents um, had a trait, and mm -hmm. I unfortunately, you have a one in four chance of being born with uh, sickle cell anemia in that circumstance, and I uh, was born with it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it's a major part of why I came to Howard University. Howard University had a sick, had a, has a sickle cell center, mm -hmm. and had a great support group, and that was very helpful to me. Um, so a lot of my care um, I, I get at Howard University as well. And so one of the things I wanted to do was to bring awareness. It's not something that I necessarily talk a lot about or have done right. a lot with the Sickle Cell Center. And I thought that it's something that I should really, in terms of trying to give back. Running is um, symbolic of one of the things that I have difficulty doing from a stamina point of view. Uh -huh. My hemoglobin doesn't carry oxygen well. And so running is more of a sacrifice from that perspective mm -hmm. uh, and, and can trigger a sickle cell crisis. But you know, I, I try to stay hydrated and obviously yeah. pace myself. And so what I decided last year is I would run uh, 5K every month uh -huh. um, this year and bring awareness and raise funds. Um, the Howard University Sickle Cell Center has a 5K themselves in September. Mm -hmm. And hopefully by the time we get to September, we'd have a lot of folks running with me. So I know a lot of people that know you that would probably challenge you on the statement that you say you pace yourself, because <laughs> those folks who know who, yeah. who know you claim that you never sleep, <laughs> that well, you're never not on the run. Yeah, yeah, that's a little different from trying to run the five k in fifteen minutes. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. So, as as it relates to sickle cell, what is the latest in terms of the research? What kind of treatment uh, is out there now, and what do you see in the future? 
Yeah, you know, the treatment has evolved um, significantly. You can actually cure sickle cell now with a stem cell transplant, and that's a... Cure, cure it? Yeah, you can, you can cure it. There have been some people who have received stem cell transplants, and that's a procedure in which you, they get stem cells that would be what we call progenitors or precursors of normal red blood cells. Mm -hmm. um, they inject it into your bone marrow that populates your bone marrow and produces red blood cells that are with hemoglobin that's normal. Uh -huh. And there are some people who had the procedure, been tested, and have no more sickle cells. All of their red blood cells are normal. That's a, I, I would say, a successor to a prior procedure which was which involved bone marrow transplant. And bone marrow transplant is very risky because yeah. you basically shut down the entire bone marrow of someone's um, body and then you inject normal bone marrow and that has to obviously take hold and and in the period of time that you give someone drugs to shut down their native bone marrow they run the risk of infection and so there have been some deaths with bone marrow transplant as you can imagine so mm -hmm. the stem cell treatment is a lot better tolerated mm -hmm. it's still being developed and it's widely available and also there's, there's a lot better supportive care in terms of pain management, recogni recognizing when you need hydration. But having said that, uh, the complications are still pretty severe. They're yeah. still, you know, very young people. When I, when I was here as an undergrad student, there were young people in my support group who had strokes yeah. and had kidney disease. And so, you know, the effects are still devastating. Yeah. We have a, we have a, actually, uh, right here, we have an upcoming uh, show that is going to be uh, on the subject of, of sickle cell. Okay. Um, so um, that is in line. I did not know that there actually was something now that is a cure. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's certainly a path to cure. It's not widely available, mm -hmm. and you still have to find mm -hmm. you know, the right um, okay. circumstances and match and so on. Okay. But so let's go into to, to some of the stuff that we you know, promoted and advertised that we were going to be talking about. Um, and sort of at the top was the, what would be the multi-layered impact of the HU, of the um, federal government shutdown yeah. on Howard University. Before you respond, we have the president uh, recently doing his address to the nation, and we'll take a look at that and then we'll come back. Tonight I am speaking to you because there is a growing humanitarian and security crisis at our southern border. Every day, Customs and Border Patrol agents encounter thousands of illegal immigrants trying to enter our country. We are out of space to hold them, and we have no way to promptly return them back home to their country. America proudly welcomes millions of lawful immigrants who enrich our society and contribute to our nation. But all Americans are hurt by uncontrolled illegal migration. It strains public resources and drives down jobs and wages. Among those hardest hit are African Americans and Hispanic Americans. Our southern border is a pipeline for vast quantities of illegal drugs, including meth, heroin, cocaine, and fentanyl. Every week, 300 of our citizens are killed by heroin alone, 90 percent of which floods across from our southern border. More Americans will die from drugs this year than were killed in the entire Vietnam War. This shutdown, um, this shutdown appears to be reaching a crisis stage across the land. Um, I would really like to get into what you, as the leader of, of this institution, Howard University, what kind of impact you see it having on Howard and the Howard community? Well, you know, this is devastating, to be, to be quite honest with you, on many levels. First is, uh, Howard University's revenues are tied to the federal government, some federal source, um, significantly. Mm -hmm. About 90% of the revenue that comes into the university comes from some federal government source, whether it's federal student loans, um, Pell Grants uh, on the healthcare side, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, um, 80 to 90 percent of our patients have Medicare and Medicaid. So yeah. th th there are lots of sources. Our research activities, uh, we, we do research through a lot of the major agencies. And so some of those agencies have to, you know, bring dollars. So that's one 
potential impact. We also have a federal appropriation. Um, as you know, we're one of no two non-military institutions in the federal government, and that's 25% uh, of our revenue. And then um, you have the personal direct impact to uh, students whose parents may be federal um, employees, right. as well as um, some federal employees who actually attend Howard. So mm -hmm. it is multi-layered, as, as you can imagine, and, and has an impact. And we also have to remember that there are lots of companies who do business with the federal government, who also do business with us, and whose parents, again, uh, parents of students may work for those companies. So it, it's really multifactorial, and, and it's hard to quantify what the specific impact may be, but we have to be vigilant about that and, and, and making sure that uh, we're supportive to our yeah. community uh, as we do that. But at the same time, we really have to advocate for this um, impasse to be brought to a close. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I knew that it was important. I really didn't know that you would describe it as devastating. Yeah, it, in, in my opinion, it's devastating because the ripple effect is the other part of the concern that we have, right? Mm -hmm. we, I mean, we keep talking about this is the longest shut down we into 20 something days but the reality is even after you some of these people get back to work um, you've now impacted their credit scores um, a lot of the students who are coming to Howard 60 percent of our undergrad population for example are Pell Grant students um, they may be applying for, for loans their parents may be applying for plus loans yeah. one of the factors in that um, adjudication of their loan application is their credit score yeah. so the ripple effect of what this may have on their credit score because they've missed paying credit card bills or they've missed um, paying their mortgage uh, could could stretch out into you know years um, from now and so it, this can really in my opinion because of the length of time it has gone yeah. and because we've now gotten into the point of it where we're not paying um, certain employees, and, and I saw last night, for instance, that um, some members of the Coast Guard, part of the Navy, aren't getting paid for yeah. the first time during one of these periods. We're actually not paying military personnel. Uh, we haven't paid um, people in the SEC, the Securities uh, Commission and, mm -hmm. and Exchange Commission, and that's affecting whether or not people can file initial public offerings and so on. So now you're looking at things that can then potentially affect the economy as a whole. Yeah. Um, it, the White House was describing that um, the gross domestic product may, um, it, it, the, the impact that they initially think it may have, it may have twice the impact. Yeah. So, th you know, I, I think that this could really have a long-term <coughs> ripple effect. Uh, you know, the short term is bad. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the long term could be worse. Well, wow. And are there things that internally, I don't want to, you know, violate any kind of confidentiality issues, sure. but are there, are, are there things internally that the university is doing to gird itself for what may be a longer term shutdown? Yeah, no, absolutely. We, we obviously are looking at our cash flow in an extended fashion mm -hmm. um, all the way to the end of the semester and making provisions for in the event that we get a slowdown of cash coming into the university from the federal sources, mm -hmm. what adjustments we would make. We're trying to make uh, provisions for students. Um, so students who are coming to the financial aid office, we're beginning to engage them, especially if their uh, parents are federal employees and they anticipate that they will have some problems, we're trying to accommodate those students and mm -hmm. make provisions for them as well. Mm -hmm. And so just looking at all of those effects and trying to uh, have a forward viewpoint of this so that we can you know, really assist students. Now going into next semester, <coughs> I think that we will have the ripple on effect of mm -hmm. you know, um, did, did this impact uh, significantly people's credit scores and their ability yeah. to take out loans, et cetera. And that obviously is a longer <coughs> look that we will have to take and we'd have to solicit our population to kind of come forward if we anticipate um, that they may have that problem. And so we're going to try to be proactive about that later in the spring in terms of trying to get those students in, a, in some type of circumstance that we can assist them. I've been extraordinarily public about my love for this institution. But there's, there's a promise I can make you, is that I don't want your job. <laughs> <laughs> I do not want. I do not want your job. It's a tough yeah. one, man. And yeah. congratulations for holding it down. I appreciate that. Um, so, yeah. just prior to the um, holiday season, there was a lot of noise. Um, 
regarding the proposed hospital in on the East End across the river. Mm -hmm. And there were passionate positions taken by, by many different sides. Can you give our viewership here a update on what has happened, why uh, there was such a, um, an, a, a, a stance taken from the Howard University position to challenge the process, um, what that all meant to the community and where we are now? Sure. So first let me start with it is a tough job, but I would also argue that it's probably the best job in the world for this very reason. Mm. The challenges that it presents are also major opportunities. The yeah. things that you can do at Howard University are things that have an impact on the entire world and can have an impact on history. Yeah. And that's how significant the institution is. Yeah. And that obviously is part of what makes a job a, a challenge. Every you know, little molehill is really a mountain because of the ripple effect, because yeah. of the central role we play. And this is, is a classic example. Uh, Howard University um, sends more African Americans to medical school in this country than any uh, ap medical school applicants than any other institution mm -hmm. in the country. And that's taking on an outsized burden, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. But when you look within the various specialties and so on, we've probably trained more African American women in surgery than anyone else through our medical school and our training program in the hospital. We've so you're, you're, you're saying then anyone else, you're not just talking about HBCUs, you're talking about no. any college. Any university. college in America, mm -hmm. any university in America, we've mm -hmm. done it mm -hmm. more than anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the black dentist, the black dermatologist, sorry, in this country, Howard University is probably responsible for 90% of those dermatologists. Mm -hmm. So, and I could go on and on about yeah. the outsized impact yeah. that we have. When you look yeah. at all African American physicians ever, trained in this country, right. Howard University is responsible for the largest number ever mm -hmm. in the history of this country. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, <coughs> what we do around the provision of academic medicine is extremely important and, and, and plays a very central role in ensuring that the healthcare um, community in this country is diversified. Mm -hmm. So we embark on trying to make sure that we have a medical school that obviously is top notch and it is we take 100 and we enroll about 120 students we get about 9500 applications a year and so there's lots of competition to mm -hmm. get in um, in 1978 um, there were more african-american males who applied to medical school than in 2014 and that's problematic so what Howard University has done is we've actually started a summer program to help with pipelining. That is a mind the number statistic. Absolutely, to, to, to try to increase the number of students that do that. So we bring HBCU students here yeah. in the summer for free. Uh, I um, pay our faculty and we put on a pre-health sciences course to get them ready for taking the MCAT and the DAT to get into dental school and medical school. Mm -hmm. So packaging all of that the hospital is central to the training aspect of that because obviously with medicine there's a basic science component but then you have the clinical component mm -hmm. and that obviously takes place in the hospital. Mm -hmm. The students and residents have to see patients, interact with more senior physicians who can guide them through the process of uh, becoming either a physician or being trained in a particular specialty. And so the clinical environment is what the hospital provides, mm -hmm. right? That's like our clinical laboratory. A few years ago, uh, when Vince Gray was mayor, I signed a letter of intent um, with him as he was leaving office to participate in building a new facility in Ward 7 and 8 um, that would ultimately replace Howard University's hospital mm -hmm. in Ward 7 and 8, and we would move our clinical um, care there. So the hospital where it is now would no correct. longer exist as a hospital. That's correct. The <coughs> hospital would be on That's the correct. east end, in it. Ward 7 or 8. That's correct. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the reason for that is when we looked at the, where we, our patients were coming from, a large number of patients were coming from Ward 7 and 8 by mission. Mm -hmm. We're dedicated to that underserved community. If you look at healthcare disparities in D.C., um, you're far likely, more likely to have end-stage renal disease, hypertension, diabetes, if you live in Ward 7 and yeah. 8, and your outcomes from those diseases 
diseases are, are more likely to be very poor mm -hmm. if you live in, in those areas. And so with that plan in mind, that's you know, where we were uh, moving. Uh, and the new mayor came in, Mayor Bowser, and she decided she wanted to re-adjudicate the process, which uh, you know, is her right as mayor. Mm -hmm. And so she did that. Mm -hmm. And so we submitted again a, a, another proposal at the end of um, December of 2017. Um, that again was similar, but a, a lot more. Um, I would say a lot more of a mature proposal because things have changed, sure. and I and I think a really strong um, proposal. I also my thinking had also evolved because I saw the issue in Ward Seven and Eight as also an opportunity to bring a new economic development zone and to probably take a slightly different take on gentrification in the city, mm -hmm. and so I also thought that. Um, there'd be an opportunity for us to move our health sciences schools to the same St. Elizabeth's campus. Mm. And that would also bring uh, lots of students between the ages of 17 to you know mid-20s, mm -hmm. as well as trainees mm -hmm. from their mid-20s to mid-30s into that neighborhood mm -hmm. where they would have to eat, live, sleep. And I think that and, we could and, also... And, and faculty. And faculty, Say, uh -huh, exactly, uh -huh, and, uh -huh. and I think that that would have also, you know, you, you, then you, you have housing that you can put up there, you have um, meals, and then we also were looking at the opportunity to train the local residents of 7 and 8 mm -hmm. into some job training in that area. I mean, you could even take it as far as developing a high school that's focused on, you know, health sciences in that neighborhood, where mm -hmm. you you'd then open up the healthcare um, field as a place where people could look for work and develop skills, you need nursing assistants, you need orderlies, I mean, you need a wide variety. And um, the children of Ward 7 and 8 can now look at the pathway to becoming physicians right. um, themselves mm -hmm. as well. Um, that, uh, so, somebody, so somebody in the federal, and somebody in the DC government made them, with, with that plan, right. I'm going to opine in a very non-objective kind of way. Somebody made a mistake by not choosing that plan, but they ju they chose another plan. <laughs> they chose another plan, okay. and um, <laughs> that was revealed in August. Um, subsequent to revealing that plan, uh, they also revealed that they wanted a, uh, to wait a waiver on the certificate of need mm -hmm. to bring about that hospital, but in addition, uh, to waive the certificate of need to build a new tower at the current GW hospital that's run by UHS, Universal Health Services. And that's where I started to become uncomfortable with that, because, and for, for the following reasons. The first is, there was no provision to include us as a university with a significant health sciences complex that includes a dent the only dental school in D.C., mm -hmm. the only pharmacy school in D.C., a nursing and allied health school, and a medical school. Which Howard has, all of those. All of those. Right. There was no plan to include us to any type of academic affiliation agreement that would allow our students to get clinical care there. Why is that important? Well, 35% plus of our patient volume is coming from World 7 and 8. If you mm -hmm. build a new facility there, that harms our business. To then offer another tower in Northwest to another facility without a certificate of need really cripples our business. Mm -hmm. And this is a business that, that I've worked hard with the team to turn yeah. around. It was yeah. losing 60 million when I first started, and now we've had three consecutive years of a positive bottom line. Yeah. So after doing all that work to then have someone take a comp give someone else a competitive and advantage. And, and so that competitive fair. advantage would be, as you said, creating another tower. So there's a southeast facility. Correct. And then coupled with that, there was going to be a place on possibly George Washington, over by George Washington. That's correct. And you're saying that that would have damaged my business, it would have damaged my clinical opportunities for my entire academic enterprise yeah. without me being able to compete. Now, don't get me wrong, if yeah. somebody files for a certificate of need yeah. and they go through the process and the district of government you know, uh, 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 award someone, that's one thing, mm -hmm. but to take away that process completely yeah. and just have somebody throw up a tower without looking at mm -hmm. the macro effect, I think is, 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 is not the right thing to do. Also, okay. you, we just suffer the closure of Providence Hospital, yes. right, as an acute care facility. And I think the district needs information on why. Why is it a difficult environment to practice in? Why are the margins so tight? Um, DC government 
o often boast about the fact that this is one of the highest insured populations in the nation, which it is. Right. Um, but we need to look at those reimbursements. We need to look at you know the patterns of care, and I think really get uh, dig a, a, a lot deeper to make sure that these are viable institutions. And then the other thing is, to be quite frank, the impact that Howard University has on the District of Columbia, I think, is sometimes underappreciated. And I think this is an example where recognizing that you have the medical school that, uh, that produces that number of black physicians in this country. You have a dental school that does that, the only dental school in the district. You have a pharmacy school, nursing and health. I think that it, it, it's something that the district should be proud of and mm -hmm. definitely should be taking measures to not just protect, but to make sure that it thrives. Mm -hmm. The district has uh, um, university in the district as well, University of District of sure. Columbia. There's not a medical school there. Mm -hmm. um, us having a collaborative relationship where there's a pathway um, for students from UDC to Howard um, law, medical school mm -hmm. and dental school, again, I think is a great opportunity. But I think all, for all of those reasons, I, I really feel strongly that an academic affiliation agreement and Howard being able to practice medicine in that facility and then have mm -hmm the students and residents be part of that uh, milieu as they gain their clinical experience, I, I felt was very, very important. You know, which, which, which brings me to something that I hadn't intended to talk about, but when I asked my wife to print off my notes today, she, this morning, she, she did that, and, 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 and here it is, I had, this was printed off, but she put something down here. She said, you know what, I had a conversation with Pam Coleman. Cam, Pam Coleman, one of the physicians at Howard Union Hospital. Yeah, good my, oh, you urologist? That's right. Good friends yeah. with my wife. Okay. And Pam was having a conversation with her la just last week about Howard's involvement in the community and that she and maybe, I guess, some of the other doctors were, had done a screening, which was a free screening. Yeah. I don't know whether it was for just men or whatever. I don't even understand what the whole mm -hmm. process was. But she was like, make sure you talk about Howard's involvement in the community that is yeah. far surpasses others. Sure, so we, we recently produced a document um, that, that we had in the works prior to this, uh, th this whole issue coming up, which was the impact that Howard University has on the District of Columbia government, mm -hmm. in, in gen District of Columbia in general, and obviously to our government relations. That document, I think, really speaks volumes to you know, the number of people we employ, the number of people we put into the workforce, but what it probably will never be able to sell fully are the volunteer hours that we put in. So screening, you, you talk about healthcare screening. I'll give you an example because I was um, involved in the cancer center, ran the cancer center at Howard, and I'll tell you some of what we do. So um, once a week we do prostate cancer screening at um, the hospital, which is free. Mm. So men can come in, um, they get their blood drawn first to check their PSA, they get a physical exam, and part of that physical exam, we perform a digital rectal exam. If they do have something abnormal or have an abnormal PSA, we then perform a biopsy free, mm. right? All of that screening um, we provide to the mm -hmm. community free of charge. On uh, once a month. You get active participation in that? We get active participation mm -hmm. in it. Significant numbers of patients come through that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, once a month we do uh, free mammogram and breast cancer screening. Mm -hmm. So patients come in, we do a full uh, physical exam, we do a focused breast exam, and um, those patients get a mammogram as well. If they have an abnormality that's found, we then cover the cost of them getting a biopsy mm -hmm. and getting the diagnosis. And so there, are, there still are people without insurance and so on that live within the district that we do that. And, and that's just an example you know, two examples of, of what we provide in terms of community involvement around health. But then, we, that, let me just be clear, my dental school does that in terms of screening and providing free dental care. Mm -hmm. You know, we have um, nutrition, nutrition science students who are shopping with um, the residents of Ward 7 and 8 right. to help them make healthy choices. And so the, the, the impact that we have in terms of involve, you know, really being invested in sure. the community is very, very significant. So can you, we kind of close this with the status now. So, so you, yeah. you, had, you had real issues with, with the process. Correct. And where do we stand now? 
So <coughs> where we stand now is that um, legislation has been passed that we, I think, successfully lobbied to have modified. And that legislation basically says that you know, the hospital will be built in, uh, on the St. E's campus and that Howard University, the District of Columbia, will work with Howard University to get, to get them an academic affiliation agreement in the new hospital and or mm -hmm. some other facility within the district. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I have a meeting uh, coming up this week with the city administrator, Rashad Young. Um, he's already sent us some information that he wanted to see. And so we're going to sit down and start that process of having that conversation to see um, if we can work out what that academic affiliation agreement. You're optimistic. Like. I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm always optimistic. Uh, and, and in this one, uh, I'm not just optimistic blindly. I'm optimistic because, again, the impact that we have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every now and then I think you get to an issue where the moral compass um, is what guides everyone. And I think, you know, that magnetic pull mm -hmm. of doing the right thing is going to get us all pointed in the right direction. Good luck. Good luck. Um, Let's move to uh, another matter of uh, importance to a whole lot of folks, including uh, King Shala from uh, Wakanda. <laughs> when, he when, he when he spoke at uh, graduation uh, last year, 2018, he talked about um, coming out of the School of Fine Arts and that the school, school of Fine Arts didn't currently exist but that it would be a really wonderful, good, and great thing that if the School of Fine Arts would come back to Howard University. Yeah. And rumor has it that, that, that's, uh, that, that, that the College of Fine Arts is yeah. returning. That's absolutely correct. Um, I propose to the board uh, to bring the College of Fine Arts back as a standalone um, college. You're right, in the late 90s, it was collapsed into the College of Liberal Arts, and that became the College of Arts and Sciences. And this coming fall, our intent is to relaunch um, the Freestanding College of Fine Arts again. Uh, and, you know, and I think there are very sound reasons. I, I always have to state that I never go back and question my predecessor's decision. Mm -hmm. um, the context and time was, was different. Sure. And you know, people make decisions based on the best um, advice they have and the best opportunity at that time. I have to, make the same, I have to do the same thing with the decisions that I'm making now. And in my opinion, the opportunity for us to really focus on a college of fine arts with the disciplines like theater arts and music and, and performing and visual arts in general, I think we, we have an opportunity to excel in that area. But mm -hmm. we have to invest in it um, very purposefully. We need a new building. Right. Um, and, and we're right now in the process of looking at plans to combine uh, the School of Communications and the College of Fine Arts in a new state-of-the-art building that we have to bring to fruition. Uh, I, and the secondary agenda, I'll be quite honest, is I think we have an opportunity to start participating on the production side, right? But production um, in the past was probably very difficult, um, you know, to, to do. And I think as technology has um, evolved and as media and communications have evolved, the ability to do that um, is, is very different and the ability to set up your own uh, production company and, and put out content um, is very different and I think there are lots of stories about the African diaspora that Howard University can tell through uh, you know a multimedia platform and so I really think that is something that um, is going to help us and help move that along and with the School of Communications um, in tandem and with our other assets including the radio station and the TV station you know, I think we have a real opportunity here to do something very special, and so we will be. You know, focused. when you talk about this College of Fine Arts, you know, sort of, I, if I if I look back and think about some <clears throat> some giants, Ossie Davis, D D Ruby D, yeah. uh, uh, Roberta Flack, Donny Donny Hathaway. Yeah. Um, I'm a little bit older than you, so I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll think back to them. But here in modern times. Yeah. The top yeah. television shows that is in our culture right now yeah. have significant Howard University influence. 
Yeah. You want to tick, any tick given, off a couple of names yeah, and, and, and folks who, who are any, representing? Sure, almost any given night when you turn the television on, there's a Howard alum. Right? My, my, have, my, my producer's got a real crush on, on two it, of the ladies. <laughs> and he's have, upset that I didn't say Felicia Rashad and Debbie Allen. Yeah, that's right. So, so you have Power with uh, Lala Anthony. Yeah. You have Empire with Taraji Henson. Mm. Uh, last night, for the first time ever, I watched This Is Us. Suzanne Kalechi Watson is a Howard alum. Yeah. Uh, Felicia Rashad is going to play her mom on that um, in some episodes coming up uh, recently. As a matter of fact, this episode last night started with them talking about one of the young men visiting Howard, which was in an episode uh, mm -hmm. before. Grey's Anatomy um, was directed you know, a, a year or two ago by Debbie Allen. So mm -hmm. almost every single night that you turn your television set on, um, you're going to see a Howard alarm in prime time. When you turn your t televisions on to CNN, Federico Whitfield, yes. and yeah. uh, you go to ESPN, you got Stan Verrett, and yeah. I could go on and on. The point is that we have it covered in yeah. almost every aspect of mm -hmm. what is really done on that multimedia platform. When you look at art, in yeah. general, and especially with so much focus on African American art, now you you have that as well. David Driscoll mm -hmm. um, and others, you know, have really exemplified what the excellence is in terms of what, what we've produced in the College of Fine Arts. So we we do have uh, a lot of alum that we've put out into the industry, and and they have done well. And I just think um, we need to really invest um, in our product across the board because uh, the, the students who are coming here are very talented mm -hmm. and I think we need to give them an opportunity to really excel, have a, have a world-class program and let that also um, retain and, and, and probably uh, some people would say regain mm -hmm. you know, the, the crown jewel um, aspect of what we do. Mm -hmm. You know, at the uh, uh, talking about that, that's uh, that's uh, 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 College of Fine Arts, and, and we're talking about theater. We're talking about entertainment. So I don't want anyone to uh, get the wrong impression uh, that we're just talking about something that is of the lesser academia world. Yeah. So so if you could share with us, because I recently read uh, about some of the scholars that we currently are one are attracting and two who are here who are receiving opportunities to further their education can you give us a snapshot yeah, of, you know, of we, some of that please yeah, absolutely I, I think what we do in that um, area is really excellent so we have a young artist here right now by the name of Jewel Ham I've, in, I've interviewed her for my show as an example um, this young lady is a talented artist, uh, you know, draws, paints, uh, you know, fantastic work. Um, she's a 4.0 student, uh, very well-rounded academically, extremely creative. And, you know, again, looking at different opportunities yeah. within the industry where she could apply her craft, and I think that that's important. And, I, and I'm also talking about scholars <laughs> outside of the world of fine arts. I mean, the, you know, because yeah. I, I know we have Fulbright, uh, 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 oh, ab absolutely, and, th and so the students that we're drawing, I think, uh, to the university also are performing extremely well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hesitate to, to put this information out um, just yet, but these well, are we, just we, the we facts. We like to break news on the our, right show. Our early, um, our early action students who applied for the November 1st deadline, uh, the average SAT for those we've accepted so far is 1,300. And My the Lord. average GPA is in the 3.6, 3.7 range. Yeah. I mean, those are Ivy League numbers yeah. now. And so who we're attracting to the university is a very, very strong academic student. And so one of the things that we've built is an Office of Undergrad Studies with an honors program, or, or, or honors scholarship focus. And that has now produced, you know, multiple Fulbrights, um, produced a lot of those high-end scholars that we think are important. The Schwartzman Scholarship, we've had a Rhodes um, scholarship winner. We've had Marshall and Truman winners. And so that's something that we're going to continue to do. This past year, we had four Rhodes finalists. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and let's put it in context. I mean, in one year, to have four students from Howard University make it all the way to the finals uh, for Rhodes is, you know, again, a testament to the strength of the students and the strength of the faculty. Mm -hmm. um, and if you could talk, speak to what has been since your tenure, 
the rise of the university in terms of its ranking yeah. in uh, U.S. News and World Report. Um, that has been, you know, when they used to put a record out, it says uh, number 80 with a bullet. <laughs> and it seems as if Howard University, if I understand it correctly, yeah. is, is, was ranked wherever it was ranked in the hundred or something, and it's got a book. Sure. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, so. Can, can you talk to the rise and what are the yeah. fundamentals of that rise in the ranking? No, absolutely. I, I think that's a good question. You know, when, when I started, we were ranked about 142. We went down to 145 as I um, came in, and then we've moved now from 145 to 89. In, in the country. And to put that in perspective. So we now are in the top 100. We're in the top 100. Of not just HBCUs, of all schools. Of national universities in this country. And okay. so there are, you know, probably a thousand plus schools that are evaluated by U.S. News and World Report. And the criteria they use, I think, is key. And I think that's really where the meat of this discussion should always fundamentally start and end. Mm -hmm. Right? And so just to be clear, I am not as excited about the ranking. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. I'll take it, but I might be back here speaking to you and we, we might go from 89 to 90 and mm -hmm. people may see that as, yeah. as an issue. What I'm more concerned about are the student outcomes. Mm -hmm. What are the student outcomes that ha has driven their analysis of us in, in such a way that has resulted in the increase in the rankings? And so those are the things that are extremely important. Uh, the U.S. News and World Report looks at the freshman, what's called, what's called a freshman retention rate. So if you bring in 100 freshmen, they look to see how many are enrolled mm -hmm. again the next year mm -hmm. in the fall. Mm -hmm. And again, when you look at the schools in the top 20, that number is 98% and higher. Mm. Right? Rarely do students um, drop out. When, we, when I came into the office, we were at about 82%. Mm -hmm. uh, we've now risen into the 90s, mm -hmm. and, and we're uh, going to maintain that and try to get better. But we've put things in place to make that happen, right? So on retention, one of the first things I recognize is that students were not taking enough credits to even be considered sophomores, mm -hmm. right? Not enough of them. Only 60% mm -hmm. of our freshmen when I started were taking enough credits to be considered sophomores. So that means that they were taking less than 30 credits in that first year. So even if they got a 4.0, Mm -hmm. They weren't considered sophomores. Right. And so we recognized that we had to make sure that people were taking at least 15 credits. So we started a GUT 15 program. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we noticed was in terms of advising and the way that was done, that students weren't necessarily uh, getting into tracks that were appropriate in terms of were they doing things that would keep them mm -hmm. um, going towards their major. And so we purchased a software system called Degree Works that the students register for classes through that. It flags the students if they register for a class that takes them off of that track. Mm -hmm. And again, that helps keep the discipline around having them do that. Making sure the students are appropriately advised as to what right. they're taking and why is another mm -hmm. area that we try to beef up. And so when you look at all of those things, it's, it keeps students on track. Still, though, the number one reason that students were not finishing um, on time or continuing was primarily because of fi uh, finances. And so with the board's approval, we started what's called a grace grant. It's targeted at students who are on Pell Grants, getting Pell Grants from the university, have a financial aid package, but end up with a gap. And we're trying to also limit the number of loans they take. Mm -hmm. And so if, that stu if our students um, perform uh, with a GPA above 2.75, 2.8, I believe, and they are on track, they stay on track for graduation, we fill that gap. Mm -hmm. So it's a big incentive for you to keep doing that. Mm -hmm. This past year, uh, the board approved that students who finish the spring semester with a zero balance and again, uh, in good academic standing, can actually take six credits over the summer uh, free without paying tuition. They pay fees but no tuition. Uh, when I start- kind of reaction you get to that? It was incredible. I mean, 1,100 more students took summer school this past summer than the prior summer. <laughs> you so had some students out so there who were saying, if it's free, it's yeah, for me. <laughs> that's it. right. and, and as well, you know, I mean, if you think about it, if you have, a, I would say, an, an odd number of credits left, meaning yeah. right now you can take 21 instead of 18, right, uh, a semester. That's another thing that the board approved. But if you're in a circumstance where you have 26 credits left, 
right, uh, mm -hmm. in the last semester, and you, you plan ahead, you can in the summer say, you know what, let me go ahead and take five credits and knock that off. I know I could take 21 in mm -hmm. the fall and I can mm -hmm. be finished. Again, we want to get them out into the um, job environment more quickly. We want to limit their cost as best we can, mm -hmm. um, and we, we want to make sure that they retain. So all, all of the categories for student outcomes, graduation rate, yeah, yeah. Um, we, we have the first graduation rate to hit, four-year graduation rate to hit 50% at Howard. Mm -hmm. um, the retention rate, as I said, um, yeah. is up. They now have a category on social mobility, looking at the Pell Grant graduation rate, mm -hmm. and you get more credit if your Pell Grant graduation rate and, you, and the graduation rate for the rest of your students, if the gap between those is minimal, mm -hmm. and ours is almost exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So all of those things, um, in terms of student outcomes, justify where we have moved in terms of that. The other thing for my alum um, that they do track is alumni giving. Yeah. When I started, that was about 4.96%. And in the last survey, um, that was up to some 13, uh, um, sorry, 11%. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, almost tripling um, the increase in the uh, alumni giving rate is also a factor. So all of those things, yeah. you know, point toward the fact that we've really moved um, the needle significantly in the areas that I think matter. So what, what, what we've heard about over the last couple of years is we've heard Howard West and Silicon yeah. Valley. And mm -hmm. can you bring us up to date as to what's being done in that area? Yeah, so Howard West is a project that we've done with Google um, in the summer of 2017. Uh, we sent 26 students out to Google. They were co-taught by Google engineers and Howard faculty. Uh, they were there for 12 weeks. They took four courses, uh, things like algorithms, machine learning, et cetera, and they got credit. So th this was an immersion type of activity, but the point here was to get Google engineers to really interact with our students so that one of the things I often hear when we talk about Silicon Valley is, well, you know, black students don't learn to code early, early enough, et cetera. And so my argument is, okay, if you if that's your reason for not hiring them, why don't you get involved in their education? Mm -hmm. And you know, if you don't do a good job teaching them, then that's on you. Mm -hmm. uh, but at least give it a shot. And so they've hired five or six of our students so far from that first project. Um, that project has now expanded into what's called the Tech Exchange. And that involves Howard University again as uh, one of the primary um, universities involved, but it, we've now added Hispanic serving institutions, of which there are 440 something um, <coughs> in the country, and um, four other HBCUs. The students are there fall and spring, which was always my initial intention for them to actually be out there during the usual academic year. The summer program was a pilot. Um, we've, they've just finished the fall um, semester and we're starting the spring semester, and so far it's gone well. The other advantage now is obviously the students are interacting with students from you know, different uh, parts of the country. I think adding the Hispanic serving institutions bring another aspect of, you know, uh, of exposure that I think our students are going to benefit tremendously from. And so I think, you know, this is something that uh, Howard University is, is very proud of having started and, and basically given to the rest of the world. You look at the sports pages recently and you see Howard University is getting ready to play uh, Harvard. Um, so, if you could speak to the relevance and importance yeah. of Howard expanding its athletic program to play against D1 schools. Yeah, so, so I, I, you know, I, think it's, I think it's very, very important. We are a D1 school. Uh, we're in the MIAC conference, and you know, we're, we're very proud of the MIAC and the schools in the MIAC. Athletics is one of the things at the university that can really help you market and take your brand elsewhere. As I just described, the yeah. students coming in are yeah. now performing academically like Ivy League um, you know, students. So even when we look at the athletes that we recruit now, bringing them into this environment, the athletes are also performing very, very well. Yeah. I mean, we have engineering students with 4.0 GPAs on yeah. the basketball team and you know, doing those types of things. And so, really getting everyone to recognize that 
it, the, the students who come here and play athletics are student athletes, and there's yeah. a reason why we still use that term. Student, They're primary student here athletes, right. for their academics. Mm -hmm. um, don't get me wrong, we don't take athletics uh, to be a hobby. Mm -hmm. We want them to win. Sure, sure. But we, we recognize that they are you know, a special type of athlete that has uh, such a very strong academic focus and background. Mm -hmm. And so, again, you know, strategically, we've positioned ourselves um, to play some of the Ivy League schools in a couple of sports. Uh, so we'll play Harvard in basketball and Martin Luther King um, Day celebration. We played them in the past. Um, on the same day, and I have to tell you, the crowd turnout was very significant. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. there were probably way too many Harvard alums <laughs> there, <laughs> right. and so we've got to check that in. But, but yeah. my goal is for young kids, especially in America, to be able to turn on their television sets or come to Bird Gymnasium and see Harvard mm -hmm. athletes and Howard athletes on the same court, um, you know, uh, uh, playing a, a, a basketball game and really getting them to understand uh, you know the significance of that 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 Howard in a lot of ways um, has really trailblazed around uh, the issue of academics in this country and in many ways um, you know Harvard is the white version of Howard correct <laughs> I would agree uh, you know when in, in preparation for the interview I was going to do with you today one of, one of, one of the people on my team I just don't know if I forgot this or I was really never aware of it, but the graduation, graduation rate of Howard athletes compared to athletes all over the country yeah. was something phenomenal. What yeah. are those statistics? Uh, you know, the graduation rate for our athletes who come here is uh, above 80 percent, and that's extremely high. Yeah. You know, there, there are... You know, some schools that bring a lot of revenue in, and especially when you look at the African-American athletes in particular, the yeah. graduation rate is, yeah. is extremely poor. And I, and I I take umbrage with that. Extremely poor as in less than 30% as in, some places. As in less than 30% some places, some places probably in the teens. Mm. And, and the reason why that's tragic is when you look at the kind of revenue that some of the major schools bring in, when you look at the top five conferences in football, as an example, yeah. Um, and you've got places like University of Alabama um, where the revenue alone from football, uh, I believe, was last reported at somewhere around $60 million. Right. You know, I mean, it, and then you have athletes who are signed up uh, to attend who, you know, don't graduate right. um, and leave there without, you know, any type of tools, you know, to, to live the rest of that yeah. very long life yeah, that they're going to yeah. live. Yeah. I think it's tragic, and I think, so sometimes when people ask me about our athletics program, I like to start with the fact that our, you know, athletes graduate at a very high rate, and mm -hmm. I think that that's us taking our primary responsibility in a sacred fashion. Mm -hmm. We are uh, just short of six weeks uh, before Charter Day. Mm -hmm. Explain Explain Charter Day, what it is, Sure, its, it's, it, its significance, and what the plans are for 2019. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, this year, uh, just like every year, something about Charter Day, you know, just really gets me going. Um, Howard University was, the, the, the charter for Howard University was signed um, on March 2nd uh, in 1867 by the 17th President of the United States. Uh, President Johnson, and he was a known racist. Yeah. Uh, he actually, on the same day he signed um, the charter for Howard University, also uh, decided that he would not sign the first Reconstruction Acts. <laughs> and that had to be worked out with Congress to get that done. Yeah. He also was responsible, ironically, for closing the Freedmen's Bureau yes. that was run by General Oliver Otis Howard, for mm -hmm. whom Howard University is named after, mm -hmm. a well-known abolitionist who got together with 16 other men, and the 17 of them uh, you know, got together to bring Howard University to fruition. So with that history, um, it's a deep history. The other thing that I'm going to really emphasize this charter day is the original charter of Howard University refers to the university as the Howard University. Mm -hmm. And I think that that singularity um, in the charter that identifies it as the Howard University speaks to uh, the special nature of it. And that's why I think celebrating charter day every year is important and critical because 
the Howard University that was created in 1867 was an ambitious project. Mm -hmm. um, it was an ambitious ideal. Does that mean the official official name of Howard University the, is the Howard University? The official name is the Howard University. Uh -huh. and, and that singularity, like I said, it, it, it speaks to the fact that there is one of a kind. Mm -hmm. um, it has a uniqueness to its mission. It has a uniqueness to the people who have come through its doors, and it has a uniqueness to the impact that it has imparted on the world. And I think that that's something that we have a responsibility to celebrate every year and try to be. You know, of all the love I had for the university, of all the things th that I've done, the passion that I've tried to show, I never knew it was the Howard University. That's good. The commentary that I that I give kind of unabashedly is is to say that Howard University is the greatest institution of higher learning in the history of the world. Right. Hats off to you for continuing a really great tradition. Thank you so much I for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Okay. Folks, thank you for joining us this evening. For more information about this program or any other program produced by WHUT, Go to WHUT.org. Goodbye and may God bless you. This program was produced by WHUT, Howard University Television, and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.